The issue that I'm going to address is if you're going to have a war on cancer, you have to have a reconstruction plan. And uh, one has to play, the more people who survive, the more you need to pay attention to that reconstruction plan to make sure that people get their life back at one end and that are appropriately supported at the other. Uh, one of the first key priorities is understanding that the cancer story has changed. Understanding that there are different sorts of cancer. So there's one group of cancer where the majority are going to live about 10 years, where really we need to focus on recovering after anti-cancer treatment and looking at the impact of cancer, cancer treatment on other illnesses in the future. The second group of cancer are people who currently live less than two years, um, who, where the real focus is early diagnosis and uh, making sure that uh, uh, they have access to new treatments but also have access to specialist palliative care. Then there's a middle group of cancers which are growing where you may have an apparently successful treatment, um, a gap of three or four years and then a new recurrence, for example hormone sensitive breast cancer, hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And in this case you may have active cancer and <clears throat> multiple lines of treatment with difficult decisions at each point in order to decide how to live your life and have the best quality of life. So the first thing that one needs to recognize is that cancer is complicated and that there will be different interventions for the different groups of cancer. Now if we focus on the first group of cancer, which is probably the largest group, making up the largest proportion of the 2.5 million cancer survivors, um, we need to think about a really effective recovery package after anti-cancer treatment. So we, make we need to make sure that they're properly assessed and there is a good conversation between the healthcare professional and patient which is based on an assessment of their needs um, uh, including financial and social and other needs than just the medical needs. So a good conversation. We need to make sure that a summary of the treatment is sent to the generalist doctor so the generalist doctor, the GP, understands what the impact of anti-cancer treatment is going to be on future illness. So that then lifestyle change, which is appropriate for the cancer patient, such as physical exercise, stopping smoking, practical things are addressed by the appropriate doctor. We need to, to, um, that, that, that there is an appropriate educational intervention um, such as which can be done in a group so that the patient and their family know what might happen next. So a recovery package is really important in terms of long-term, you know, in terms of the long-term survivorship. We know <coughs> that people who are going to have to have difficult decisions at the time of recurrence need appropriate support. And we know if they have a specialist nurse or equivalent um, during that um, uh, decision-making process, they are more likely to be informed and they are more likely to be able to make the difficult decisions. So we need to make sure that appropriate support is in place too. Now there's two things we need to think about here. Um, the first is um, we know that there are a lot of uh, interventions in patient, the survivorship population which don't add value. We know that a lot of patients with breast cancer are coming to hospital and having follow-up appointments which take a lot of time out of their life but don't necessarily either pick up recurrence or help with the long-term consequences of treatment. And we know um, from the National Cancer Survivorship Initiative and more recently from the uh, Macmillan Northern Ireland Partnership that it is possible for, for example, breast cancer patients with a proper recovery package not to, to require the hospital-based follow-up, which releases resource and enables us, the, the, the patients, to have the appropriate um, recovery package. So it's making sure that you use resources appropriately. Um, the second thing, which will, in terms of, uh, of helping with cost, is to make sure that the right patients have the right treatments. So we know, for example, that spe early specialist palliative care um, in patients with advanced disease can significantly reduce hospital um, admissions. We also know that in some cases, appropriate specialist palliative care can actually improve survival. 
So that allows a much more nuanced and balanced discussion with patients to avoid futile overtreatment at the end of life while enabling new drugs to be tested. Many patients now with cancer now will have um, other comorbidities. So we know that 50% um, of cancer patients will have either heart disease or hypertension. Um, a significant number will have um, arthritis or diabetes. But most randomized controlled trials don't include patients with comorbidities so that you can get a, um, a disproportionate view as, of, of the benefits of treatment because these comorbidities aren't included. So it's really important that we have real life data of patients with comorbidities in order to make proper judgments about the impact of new treatments. Um, the second point I'd like to make is we know that one in four people um, uh, who are uh, surviving cancer will be living with the consequences of anti-cancer treatment. Um, and currently, we are not measuring those things. And we have to move from thinking just about the big things like uh, second malignancy and cardiovascular disease and bone fracture to the small things which make a difference between whether older people remain independent and younger people get their lives back. So things like fatigue and uh, bowel control, which are not the big things, not the big toxicities, but those things may make the difference between whether people get their lives back or whether people maintain their independence. So we need to be measuring the small things as a result of anti-cancer treatment and the impact that they have on quality of life. There is no question that, uh, uh, that uh, the cancer plan, the national cancer, if the, if the national cancer plan were fully implemented and appropriately resourced, it would improve care for cancer patients. And so that is an important factor. But it's also important to know that small things that don't cost a lot of money can significantly improve quality of life. The example I always use is that um, uh, in the UK, there is a scheme for um, toilets, lavatories, to be uh, available to people who have a key if they have a, a medical problem. One in five patients with colorectal cancer will have bowel problems. That's what keeps them at home. If you uh, teach oncologists or colorectal surgeons, the majority of people don't know about that. So that's a piece of information which could be given to everybody which could revolutionize uh, people's lives. So small things sometimes can make a difference which don't cost money. It just requires people to recognize that these things are important. Mm -hmm.